Um, we're, we're here really to commemorate um, and mark, this, is, this week marks the United Nations uh, Memorial of the Holocaust and we're very, very privileged to have Michelle here with us who is a third generation of Holocaust survivor and come to speak to us and particular to our South Island students um, to talk about his um, understanding and experience from his family's perspective to give them a really uh, a good understanding of um, the impact that this has had on people around the world. And we'd like to especially thank the Hong Kong Mem Holocaust Memorial Centre for helping to facilitate um, this, this talk today. Um, so first of all, Michelle, thank you so much for, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, and I know that uh, Miss Nicholas and I in particular are, are very interested um, and honoured to, to have you speaking to us and sharing uh, your family's experiences. Um, so one of the first questions that we had from our students was what was your family life like growing up? Um, you know, where did you grow up and what were the biggest influences on you growing up? So I, I grew up in, in Belgium, in, in Brussels, you know, fairly uh, normal family life, uh, I'd say, as an only child. Um, <coughs> and, and certainly my mother was the biggest influencer into, uh, into my life growing up. Uh, so in terms of your knowledge about the Holocaust, what, uh, how much did you actually know about the Holocaust growing up? I do not remember at what age my, my parents and grandparents started to talk to me about their experiences. Um, but I think it was, it was fairly early on um, because my, my father was hidden as a, as a child, as a two-year-old, and didn't get to see his mother for the next three years. Um, you know, my mother as a, as a half brother whose mother was murdered in, murdered in Auschwitz. So I can't tell you exactly at what age the topic was introduced. And I don't think, I do not recall that, you know, we had a, a formal family sit down uh, saying, okay, now it's time to introduce the topic to Michelle. It's just bits and pieces uh, you know, became more and more evident over time about sort of my, my family's uh, experience, history. When did you first become aware of the direct impact that the Holocaust had on, on your family? Um, and was it something that was openly talked about? So, you know, I'll start with the second part. It was definitely not openly talked. And uh, as a matter of fact, I've only learned about many of the, the details really in the last 10, 20 years where my grandmother especially became more open and it became important for her to share those details with my kids and, and with me. Uh, but growing up, there was not a lot of discussions around the topic. Um, more in in general, I would say about you know what the the Shoah, the Holocaust, what impact it had had on the you know European Jewish community, um, but not a whole lot about you know the our family uh, specifically at home. Probably with the exception of my dad, who you know would often make sort of silly jokes and explaining why he had yellow teeth because, you know, he had no parents for, you know, from age two to age five, so he wasn't brushing his teeth, right? Uh, <laughs> that, you know, that, that sort of things. But, uh, but, it, wasn't, uh, but it, it wasn't discussed openly much. So you, you, you sort of gave us a, a little uh, snippet of some stories that, that were, were told to you as a child. Um, what were some of the most vivid stories you remember being told um, of your family's life uh, pre and during the war? So, so the most direct story is, you know, the story of my, my father, who, you know, was the son of Hungarian Jews, 
as a result of being an Hungarian Jew and because the Hungarians were allies of the Germans, he had a more protected status than other Jews, other Belgian Jews. And um, as a result, he only needed to go into hiding uh, in 42, in 1942. And as part of the network, he was uh, hidden in a Christian orph orphanage far from Brussels, where the view was that there would be few Germans who would be uh, coming, searching for, you know, Jews. Um, and, and one of the stories that he does remember and that he told me is that one day, and, you know, he's a three or four year old, uh, and, and half of the kids in the orphanage were hidden Jews. Um, and, and actually two stories that I remember him telling, telling me. One, uh, there was somebody in the nearby village who had told the Germans that they were hidden Jews and, 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 and the German army was coming up to the place where they were hiding. And luckily, one of the villagers ran through the woods mm -hmm. to warn uh, the um, to warn the, the adults who were looking after them that the Germans were ar arriving. And there was a, it was, supposedly it was a big home, big house and it was an exit door and the Jewish kids were able to run into the woods and hide in the woods uh, while the Germans were slowly uh, driving up uh, to, to that place. So that's one story I remember. A more, you know, a more fun story, you know, maybe for kids is that my dad would tell me that once a year, there was somebody who would come there and he didn't know who it was. And that woman would give him chocolate. And that he remembers very well. And my dad still has got a sweet tooth. And essentially it was his mother, but he didn't know, he didn't, he wouldn't recognize his mother because he had been hidden as a two-year-old. So he wouldn't recognize his mother, but there was that lady who would come once a year and wouldn't say who she is and would give him some chocolate and probably would take major risk on her life uh, to just see her son. But for security purposes, all the kids had been given fake names. And that's why she wouldn't say that she's actually uh, his man. She would just come see that he's okay and, and leave after, I suppose, a couple of hours. Um, the, the other thing that I remember, and that was much less openly discussed in, in my family, and, and maybe I'll tell you a little bit why at the end of the story or, or later on is on my mother's side. So she has a half brother and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really made clear to me as a kid, why my mother had a half brother and why my grandmother was not the mother of my uncle. The only thing that they were telling me is that he was a few years older than my mother. And after the war, he, he immigrated to Israel on his own and left his dad, my grandmother, uh, his adoptive mother, I suppose, and my mother by themselves in Belgium, but left uh, after a couple of years, Belgium to live on his own in Israel. And Nobody told me any of the details. Wow. Later on. So I, I don't don't really know what what to say. That I mean that that image of of your father in the orphanage and not knowing who his mother was um, is, is really vivid for me. And and you know being warned by a villager running up the road to the orphanage, but also knowing that people in the village have also betrayed sort of the, the secret is, is something that's quite hard to, to comprehend. Um, so thank you for, for sharing, sharing that with us. Um, and I mean, it, it, it kind of explains some of, some of the aspects to the next question, which is uh, how were your family able to, to survive the Holocaust or escape and, and restart their lives in, in a new community? Obviously, you said that your, your father went into to hiding. Um, but, you know, what else can you tell us about sort of 
their lives during that that period yeah uh, so 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 my dad you know came back home as a five-year-old uh obviously from a, a schooling perspective he, he was behind it was uh and you know it's it's interesting my dad is i believe extremely intelligent he's a he's a chess you know not master but you know he, he He's an excellent chess player, but he wasn't able to study. He wasn't able to study because by the time he got home, uh, his parents had, had lost everything. Um, had been in hiding themselves, were not really compensated by the state. Um, decided to immigrate to Israel in 1948. Um, you know, at the time, the state wasn't well equipped to look after all those poor immigrants. Um, you know, he explained to me that for a number of years, he, he, lived, he lived on a wooden cabana or something like that, sleeping on the floor where, you know, you'd occasionally have snakes and scorpions. So he was very, very happy, but from a, a schooling perspective, wasn't really working out. After five years, his parents said, we can't readjust to the Middle East, we are going back. And so then he went back to Belgium and he was way behind and by age 16, uh, you know, stopped school, um, ended up, you know, being a successful businessman, but, um, but, he, but, but there's a massive ship on his shoulder that he didn't really have a chance to, to study and to, to be developed in a, in a normal home. And up to this day, um, he has some psychological damage and, and he's a bit paranoiac. He, he stresses out in airports. Um, and, and um, yeah, so, so there's, there's certainly some, some damage. And, and on the other side of my family, on, on my mother's side, you know, the, 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 there's certainly uh, some damage as well because ultimately she had a half brother uh, she wasn't told that she had the half brother. She was told that there was a family, a friend of the family who was living in Israel and, and who had left. And for 10 years, he lived in Israel before coming back to Belgium. Uh, the only contact they had uh, was via letters. And she discovered that she had a brother as a 10 or 12 year old. Um, when someone in the family told her, come on now, stop being so stupid and so dumb. Your mom and your, your mom and, and your dad are married and your dad had a brother and uh, uh, had, a, had a son, you know, from a previous marriage. And that's why they all live together. But actually right after the war to pres you know, because they, they didn't know what to do. Uh, my grandfather and my grandmother did not live in the same home and my the, my uncle was living with his father and my grandmother was living with my mother and they didn't dare to be together because they were a bit afraid um, my mother also was given a fake name during the war uh, to avoid um, the risk of being a uh, you know, the, the risk of, of, of people knowing that she'd be Jewish. Um, and after the war, there were a lot of family conversations about changing her name to a real name. Um, and they decided not to because they were afraid that with a Jewish name, it was too dangerous and things would happen again. And that as a, you know, and they decide to, to take the safe road. Um, 20 years ago, my mother decided that, you know, there was enough war on the bridge and she wanted to have my grandfather's name. And so she wanted to change her family name, I hired a law firm, went to the Belgium uh, civil administration um, and was turned on by the civil administration who um, I assumed that you know, they came across someone in the administration who hated Jews, but essentially said, we don't have any real proof that your father is who you, who you say he is. And we don't believe that the ground is sufficient 
for us to make an exception because my grandfather wasn't alive. Um, and the fact that your half brother is testifying that your father is your father uh, is not sufficient for us and we will not change this. Which frankly is, uh, yeah, I mean, it was devastating for her. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, particularly as she, you know, to, to make that big decision, obviously there was, you know, it took time for her to, to, to feel okay to do that. And then sort of to be, you know, let down by an authority who mm. really, you know, why do you have that, that um, power to be able to make that decision? Mm. Yeah. And our, our names are so important yeah. to us. So to, to feel like she could claim back her heritage and then to be denied is is just horrifying yeah it really is it really is and you know the the lawyer who dealt with it was as shocked as we were he said that certainly never expected that type of outcome and and it was emotionally too hard to appeal and so we uh, she gave up and uh, just to sort of follow up from that, do, do, do you know if, or your parents know if this was something that uh, regularly happened to people? I mean, I, I suspect this might have been uh, something that a number of um, survivors decided to do at, at later dates. And is this sort of a, a similar pattern that they've experienced as well? Yes and no. I, I, most Jews that changed their name and had fake ID made uh, during the war, tended to change back their name right after the war. You know, my mother was a little bit of an a, a exception, and she was an exception because, um, you know, m moving into some of the details, essentially what had happened is that my grandfather spent many years in Germany before the war. He was a Polish Jew that fled Poland because of anti-Semitism from the Poles and the Russians. And his parents had been subjected to a lot of attacks by the Russians and the Poles on villages where Jews were, and decided as a teenager, as 18 year olds to, uh, to flee and went to Germany. Had a wonderful life in Germany for 20 years, uh, married, had a son, my uncle. And then when Hitler um, got to power in Germany in 33, things obviously became a lot harder uh, for Jews. Um, and in 38, 39, they decided to flee Germany and fled um, and, and, and cross illegally the border into Belgium, which by itself was a very you know, difficult affair. There were multiple attempts. Some people took their money to help them to go through and then never help them. Uh, and, and my uncle and his mother were actually arrested by the German army. Uh, and then we don't know why they were released. And actually one German officer even pointed to the Belgian border to help them escape. Uh, just to show you that, you know, there are you know, good people on, on all sides. But essentially after being arrested, they were released. And my uncle remembers that a German officer was in a car and told them, no, no, you're going the, right, the wrong way. I think that you wanna cross, you wanna cross this way. And they ended up being in Belgium. And, and, and once the Germans invaded Belgium, then my grandfather family had to go into hiding. And they went into hiding into a Belgian family. That Belgian family was paid to bring them food every day and they were hiding in a basement. But my grandfather did not have enough money and so would go out and illegally work, not showing his yellow star, having a fake ID, and every day would go out at the risk of his life to, to, to work. And one day, he came back and the German army had closed up the neighborhood and they would search house by house if they were hidden Jews. And his wife was caught by the German 
sent to an extermination camp in Auschwitz and was murdered there by the Germans um, you know, within a few months. My grandmother is the teenage girl who was bringing food every day to my grandfather in hiding. Wow. And it was the young daughter of that Belgian Christian family that at the risk of their life were hiding Jews. And, and so, and my mother, you know, is born um, essentially 12 months after um, my grandfather's first wife was arrested by the Germans for being Jewish. So you can imagine on why this is a very mm. difficult story to tell and why I've learned many of those details much later in my life than when I was a young kid, because although I don't think that one can judge, they probably had some level of guilt of the way things happened. And they certainly never opened up to my mother until she was, uh, she was an adult about you know, many of the details of what happened, and which also resulted with my grandmother not being Jewish in, um, in a lot of family pressure of saying, we should never change the name and we should keep a Belgian name as opposed to a Jewish name because things like that will probably happen again. Wow. Um, sorry. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that it, you, you, again, sort of picked up on was, um, you know, the idea of, you know, possibly people, you, you mentioned about people, like one of your family members going to Israel and then coming back because it, it didn't quite work out for them. Um, was there any influences that you feel that the Holocaust had on your family's faith or even customs at all? Yeah, probably true. Uh, you know, my my parents aren't believers. And, you know, like many survivors said, well, you know, for us, you know, God is is died in the gas chambers. Um, on the other end, um, from a, a custom stand, standpoint, you know, certainly for me, I, I feel a very strong Jewish identity. And um, keeping the custom, keeping the faith, keeping some of the tradition alive um, is sort of my way of, of, of reacting, of, of answering to the, to the extent I, I can in the same way that, you know, I feel a very strong connection to the state of Israel and I'm a strong Zionist and, you know, I believe that you know the right of Jews to have a state is or my belief in that is strongly linked to to what happened to my family and to to the fact that you know we cannot be anymore in a situation where there is no place that will accept you and you can flee somewhere if you need to yeah 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 it's, it's hard to know sort of what to say in in re response to to hearing you share your story um and what happened to to your family so again i want to say thank you for for sharing it with us um and sort of talk to you more about the your need to to share the the, the story and why did you decide that actually your family's story is, is one that you wanted to share with us? Well, I think that, you know, there are a lot of interesting twists. I think that it's a story that demonstrates you that, you know, it's never black and white. Um, and, and, you know, there, there was certainly a minority of of good people on, on the German side and, and on, on the Belgian side, as well as a lot of bad people. Um, you know, I think, and, but ultimately, 
you know, half of the Jewish European population was murdered, right? Which is pretty hard to imagine. Fifty percent of European Jews were were murdered by the German and its allies during the war, um, and life is never going to be the same for you know the Jewish world, the Jewish population. But I think that. The lesson for me that's that's important to to repeat is for this not to happen again to Jews and to to other minorities um, that you know people should not be um, chastised for uh, for who they are um, and you know we see you know globally a, a lot of issues they're not exactly the same but they may be. Some similarities, they love racism around for sure. And, um, and I, I do think that, you know, explain the story is, is, is maybe one way to increase the probability that it will not happen again. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Yeah, which is why you, we felt it was so important to come together with our mm. different faculties and our different year groups to, to make sure that this was something that our students um, are aware of mm. and have had some exposure to in terms of, of learning about, um, you know, learning about the Holocaust, but also learning about, you know, the impact that this has, you know, because we can, we could always look at an event in isolation mm. and learn yep. about it. But actually what's so important is learning about, you know, the impact that it has and, and what do we do with that information. Mm. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, again, kind of following on from um, what Flick um, mentioned in terms of sort of, you, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, why you decided to speak. And so I, I kind of want to find out a little bit more about maybe what the lasting, what you feel is the lasting impact that the Holocaust has maybe had on you um, and also, how, what do you feel about um, whether there's been reparation? What do you feel about reparation for the European Jews in terms of, do you feel there has been real reparation or not? I mean, there's been some form of reparation, but, you know, ultim ultimately I don't think that uh, that you can reparate what, what happened when, you know, when, when, when you exterminate very large percentage of one population um, when many cities uh, where there were large Jewish population after the war were cities where there were no Jews left, you know, the, this is not something that can, that can, that can be repaired. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, 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 the certainly been attempt and a lot of efforts to, to, to give some some compensation, but you can't really you can't compensate for 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 something like this. It's happened. It's sad, and and it's it it cannot be uh, it cannot be repaired. Um, and you know, quite frankly, it's it's very worrying to, for me to see that uh, you know being in Hong Kong as a Jew is is a great place. Being in Europe today as a Jew is not anymore a very good place to be uh, and and can be dangerous at times uh, so it's it's kind of sad to see that uh, uh, the lesson has not been learned um, you know in terms of, of of the personal impact you know for me um, it's it's certainly had an impact that in, in the sense that I, 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 I talk to my kids about, you know, what, what's happened. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's important to them. And, uh, and as a result, it has an impact on, on your identity and, and certainly how you feel about other minorities. Yeah. And sort of join, joining sort of the, the two ideas together then and, and sort of you, you talked about the the influence it's had on you in terms of shaping the conversations you've had with, with your children. Um, how do you think being that third generation 
Holocaust survivor, how do you think that has pay, paid a part in the way that you've lived your life or, or the, how has it shaped your, your life more generally, do you think? Um, it's, you know, it's honestly hard to say, mm -hmm. it's hard to, uh, to say, you know, I, I would, I would hope that, you know, I, I, I've learned from many of those lessons and it's, you know, and it's made me a better person. Um, but, uh, you know, beyond that, I'm, I'm not really sure. I've, I've been I've been very fortunate to uh, to be to be born in a in a in a much better time and to have many many of the opportunities and, and chances that my parents and grandparents did not to and to have a you know a, a very normal life. Do you do you think then that being having the unique perspective that you do? I mean, you, you touched on it earlier. Um, and the links that you can see between um, what's happening in in modern Europe and, and America with, with other minority and persecuted groups. Does, does that shape how you personally sort of perceive that, that racism and extremist viewpoint? And, and you know, I, I guess I'm trying to say, like, what are your thoughts on it? Based on on your experiences, as you know, a, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Listen, you know, Jews have been the the scapegoats of of governments for hundreds of years, or thousands of years, and and certainly when you see, you know, the way geopolitics is is evolving, whether it's you know in the United States or or in some European countries, and you know, with the you know extreme right and extreme left as well having increasingly more power and 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 being increasingly less open to the others and and the ideas that are not theirs it's it's certainly a very worrying very worrying developments um and but but mostly around the fact that uh, increasingly, it seems that the, the 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 other opinion is not respected, and I think that you know my view is that it's okay to have to have different views and different opinions, uh, as long as you know we are respecting each other, mm. and there's a bit of a breakdown there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, that kind of really nicely sort of leads us to my. Um, final question really which is about what would you like to leave with people here what would you like to, what sort of message would you like to leave with our students of South Island School and, and what would you like people to remember about you and your experience and your family's experience the main message I, I would like to leave is uh, is to remember that being different is not better or worse. Being different just means being different, and that uh, it's it's enriching to uh, to society to have different profile, uh, different experiences, different histories, different customs. Um, they don't need to be yours. You don't need to to have those customs, but it's very important to to respect the others and to learn about the others, uh, to try to live in um, in 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 harmony. Thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing some of your experiences and your family's experiences of, of the war and the Holocaust with yeah. you. Yes. We, we, we are, I'm going to say it again, we feel honoured to have been a part of the conversation with you today and, and thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to uh, share my family story. <laughs>